Hey everyone, it's me, Aaron, and welcome to another episode of Comic Class, the show every single week on this channel where we just geek out about comic books, and this is a very important week for comics. This is one of the biggest, most massive, hugest weeks for comics that you've ever seen because... I got nothing. Yeah, this is actually, uh, kind of an uneventful week for comics. I don't mean stuff didn't come out, I just mean that for the first time in a long while, there's no massive, huge crossover starting. There's no brand new number one. Nothing of really any importance is ending this week. There was nothing that was announced, unless it's being announced while I'm recording this, which would be totally par for the course for the comic book community. But, yeah, I don't really have anything that pressing to talk about this week. Which means that for the first time in a long time, I can actually talk about whatever I want to talk about. I don't know what I want to talk about. So, I decided to ask the patrons over on our Patreon account if they had any suggestions for what they wanted this week's episode to be on, and Avalon Girls said they wanted me to talk about an indie book that I'm really into. They said that they really enjoy my indie recommendations, and you know what? It has been a while since we have done an indie spotlight, and there is indeed a book out there on the indie scene that has kind of blown up. A lot of people have already said this might very well be the contender for everyone's book of the year, and it's the brand new series from Karen Gillian, Die. Now, for anybody who is wondering why this series has such a morbid title, it's because Die is the singular for dice, a tool that is often used in role-playing or RPG games, such as Dungeons and & Dragons, and this whole series is basically a giant love letter to role-playing games. It's also because this series is incredibly morbid. Yeah, let me just go ahead and give you guys some backstory on this. I went into this book knowing that everyone was praising it, but it's by Karen Gillian, and whenever I read a Karen Gillian book, I look at it and I go, I know why people love this, but it's not for me. Like Wicked and Divine, I read that book and I go, I absolutely understand why the audience for this book will 100% love this book and will be their favorite thing that they have ever read in their life. It's not for me. It's not really my thing. And that kind of goes for almost all of Karen Gillian's career. Even Young Avengers, which everybody loved. And it was the thing that introduced a wide audience to Karen Gillian. I liked it, didn't love it, but I could understand why people would love it. So I went into this kind of expecting to like it, not love it, but understand why people could love it. I freaking love this book. This thing, we are about a third of the way through the year and whoo doggy, it is going to be tough for anything out there right now to beat it for my number one book of the year. And we're only at chapter five of this thing. So, what is this book about? This is about a group of friends in 1991, each of them between 13 and 16 years old, and they're going over to their friend Solomon's house for his birthday. Now, when they get there, Solomon says, all right, we're going to play a game, but it's a brand new game that I came up with. And he's explaining all the rules for this. He's having each of them create their own unique characters. And he's got this own unique role in the world that he's created that matches the characters that they've come up with. But every single one of them gets assigned a different type of dice. And I will admit, I've never played Dungeons and Dragons. It's just never really seemed like my type of thing. But I used to play Magic the Gathering all the time, so I'm familiar with the different types of dice out there, and every single one of them gets their own different one. Uh, like our protagonist, Ash, they end up getting the D4, but then another one gets the D6, and there's the D... all the other ones throughout the list. There's many of them. Uh, but I just said, I'm very familiar with all the different types of dice out there, and then I immediately stop after D6, probably a higher number... There's a D20 in there somewhere. You know what, it's, it's all gets explained in the plot in there somewhere. So, they're about to begin playing this game. And then it cuts ahead by a few hours. And Solomon's mom comes up there to check on them, and they're just gone. Then it cuts ahead by two years. And the six friends reappear. Except now there's only five of them. And one of them is missing an arm and none of them can talk about what it is that they just went through. Something happened to them, but there is something preventing them from being able to mention it, or being able to talk about what happened to Solomon. Why is Solomon missing? Why is Ash's sister missing a freaking arm? What happened to these people? Then it cuts ahead to the present day. They're now all adults, they're all getting close to turning 40, and all of a sudden, Solomon's D20 pops back up, and it's now covered in blood, 
So they have to go and return to the place that they escaped from. So many of you have probably already put it together and you figured out what this is, but basically it's evil Jumanji. That's a sentence I never thought I would say. Uh, so they basically have to return to the world that Solomon made in this game and they have to find Solomon all over again. And this is the point where I have to start asking myself, how much of this story do I want to reveal to you guys? Because there are indeed big twists that happen. So I'm not going to say what they find when they return there, but let's just say they've all been back in the normal world for 25 years. Solomon has been stuck in this world that he created for 25 years. Uh, Solomon is not the same person that they left. Something has gone down with Solomon. So they need to figure out how on earth they are going to return now. And I remember seeing in an interview, they said that this was going to be partly inspired by Jumanji, but it's also going to be partly inspired by that Dungeons and Dragons cartoon that came out when I was a little kid. And I remember when I was a kid and I saw the original Jumanji and I saw that Dungeons and Dragons cartoon, I never once thought that was like a fantastical, wondrous thing. I always looked at it as terrifying. When Robin Williams pops back out of the Jumanji game and he had just been living in that world for decades, I didn't look at that and go, oh, it's Robin Williams, hooray, he's going to provide some humor and light and heartness to all this. No, heartness is not a word. He's going to provide some fun times with this. No, I looked at that and went, this guy has been through hell. That is a nightmare scenario. And then when I was watching the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon when I was a kid, I would look at that and go, these are just some poor kids who are now in this world full of Dungeons and Dragons. That's not a big fun thing. That's actually terrifying. And this book is basically that. This book is saying, no, no, no. If you actually got swept up for years and tossed into a world full of monsters and demons and orcs and trolls and magic and war and all these other terrible things, yeah, it would be all these terrible things. It would be a nightmare scenario. And this book fully embraces that and it establishes the tone for that perfectly. I stopped reading the first issue about three times before they even got to the point where they got sucked into this game because every now and again, I would get to a point in which I would just have to stop and go. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, I would just have to stop and look at that and say, I know some terrible stuff is about to go down. I know that something horrifying is going to happen to these kids. I don't want to see anything horrifying happen to these kids. This book opens up with Ash going over to see Solomon, to see their friend, and Ash has their sister with them because their sister's dog recently passed away and they said the only way that I could get her to stop hollering was to invite her over to my friend's place for their birthday. And I just went, this young girl just lost her dog and now she is about to go into a horrifying, torturous nightmare world. I, oh, I don't want to read this. I do not want to see where this story goes. Before we even got to where the story began, I already felt so bad about what was going to happen to these kids. And let me just go ahead and say, you never see what happened to them when they were in that world as kids. You are following them as adults returning to this world, but they keep mentioning, oh, we can't go to that place because of the stuff that we did there when we were kids. And I keep looking at this going, Oh my god, they have got like a long plan for this. They have really just mapped out in here so many different stories about what happened to them during those missing two years and you know that all that is going to have a payoff. You instantly get that feeling as you're reading this that the stuff that they did two years ago that they can't mention, not two years ago, 25 years ago during those missing two years, they did so many things during that that they can't even mention because they were so horrible and you know they're all going to come back around. When I was reading this, I kept thinking to myself, you know what, it would kind of be nice if maybe we cut back and forth between the present day and what happened to them during those missing two years all those decades ago. But as I got further along and you, st and you started to see how all of that was weighing on them, I thought, no, 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 this is actually smart what they're doing. This is really smart that they're making us wait for this. That they are just giving us those little hints of, 
here's all the horrible stuff that we can't even talk about anymore. And it just makes me think, oh man, eventually at some point they're going to talk about this and I can't wait for them to talk about this. In fact, that's another really interesting thing about this. As I said, when they return from those missing two years, they say that they cannot say. They cannot say at all what happened to them. It gets revealed, and this is not really a spoiler in here. This is more of just an interesting part of the plot. Uh, that might actually be the definition of a spoiler. Uh, but it gets revealed in here that the reason why they have now spent 25 years in the present, unable to talk about the things that they did in that world, was because as they left, they had a spell placed on them that actually made it impossible for them to mention anything that happened to them while they were in this world. So that actually provides a whole new layer to this story because now, for the first time in 25 years, not only do they have to return to this world, but now that they're back in this world, they can now actually finally talk about this. These people, for 25 years, have had this thing weighing on them and it prevented them from ever being able to deal with all the horrible stuff that they had to go through, now for the first time in their entire lives, they can actually talk about and deal with the horrible things that they went through. So that just opens up all these possibilities for conversations that they can have, and honestly, they need to have. And as I said, each of these kids, when they were about to start this game, they had to create their characters. However, the person who created the game, Solomon, he already has specific characters that live in this world so they would come up with their version of a character and he would say okay in my world that's known as this but the versions of the characters that he created because it's his world they each have specific rules about them and a lot of those rules come with consequences to them and watching them get sent into this world where they don't just have magical wondrous powers they also have big repercussions for those magical wondrous powers. You can tell something is going to go horribly wrong with this. Like uh, Ash's sister, uh, she wasn't really into Dungeons and Dragons, she was more into like cyborgs and science fiction stuff, so she wanted to be some cyberpunk character, and Solomon's like, oh don't worry, I have a character like that, it's called a Neo. When you get into that world, Neos are people who collect magical wondrous pieces of machinery but those magical wondrous pieces of machinery kind of fuse to their bodies and they require this very specific type of mineral in order to operate and whenever you put that mineral into your system it only lasts for a day so you wake up the next morning really needing your next fix so this little kid who just wanted to have a fun time with cyborgs and robots she's now a junkie she was now forced to become a junkie who really needed to find this special mineral, otherwise her system would just start to break down and she wouldn't be able to use any of her body. Oh my god, that is horrifying! And you haven't even seen how it's going to really pay off yet. All that is just the setup. We're still waiting for this to get really dark about that. And I feel really dirty talking like I'm excited to see a story get this dark, but it's because the build-up to it is so good. And I'm a guy who just wants payoff in story. And the buildup for these dark modes that you know are coming is so incredibly good in here. Like, there's another guy in here. He was kind of the frat boy of the crew. He was the guy who was just like, ah, I'm just gonna make fun of everything and nothing really bothers me. I'm just gonna be totally fine no matter what happens. His character type is the Fool. And the Fool's power is that he has amazing luck. But only if he leans into it. Only if he does dumb stuff does his luck powers really activate. Meaning, he has to charge into battle, he has to go in there and take on monsters that are way bigger than him, and as long as he does that, and as long as he's courageous, you know it's all gonna work out for him. But you also have that feeling in the back of your head this entire time, oh, it's not always going to work out for him. You know that eventually there will come the day when his luck just will not pay off. There will come that day where his luck's going to run out. And remember, his luck powers are activated by going into danger. So it's not like something will just find him and then his luck powers will run out. No, no, no. This guy has to get in way over his head. And you know that day is coming as you are reading this. And don't even get me started on the Grief Knight. The Grief Knight is the best character in this entire book. 
because he was this guy who suffered a lot from depression and just really crippling anxiety and all these issues when he was a kid, but he spent his entire life overcoming that. He has spent his entire life turning all that around, but now he's back in the magical world. And the Grief Knight is a character who gains more power the sadder he is. And there comes the moment in which he is in this world as an adult and he's going, I'm not that person anymore, I'm not going to become that person. But in order to save his friends, he kind of has to embrace all the darkness that has been building up inside of him this entire time. Oh my god, that is just really smart storytelling right there. That is an amazing thing to do with a character. And I feel really bad saying it's an amazing thing to do with a character because I like these characters and I'm basically applauding them being treated horribly. I'm basically applauding the terrible dark things that are going to happen to them. But man, I have always said the point of art is to get you invested. It's to make you feel an emotion from someone expressing a story. Yeah, man, that's what this does. This entire series is just me, page after page, just gasping at what is going to happen to these characters and wanting to see the next thing that's going to happen to these characters, even when I'm afraid to see what the next thing that's going to happen to these characters are. I'm getting so excited now, I'm jumbling up all my words, but you know what I'm talking about. And the world that's been created in this game is really impressive because it feels like a fantasy world that was created by a bunch of 16 year old people who really love fantasy worlds. Because there comes a moment in here in which they are saying, yeah, all this is just reference to other stuff out there. None of this is really all that original. And issue three of this is all just one big salute to Tolkien. And I don't mean like, oh, Lord of the Rings. No, I mean Tolkien, the person. Because remember, Tolkien was in the Great War. Tolkien was in World War I and they're going through this part of the map that is basically just World War I. And they basically end up meeting Tolkien. Not a character from his books, the actual guy. And he gives them some really meaningful advice that helps them out. You know, the exact kind of thing that someone who was, say, a 16-year-old big fantasy Dungeons & Dragons Lord of the Rings fan would probably want to hear. And you look at that and you go, wow, that is an incredibly touching salute to one of the greatest fantasy writers of all time, and it really feels like something that a 16-year-old Lord of the Rings fan would put in his fantasy game. So it absolutely fits for this world. I do kind of feel like they brought it on a little bit too early. I mean, you have, like, issue number one is setting up the premise. Issue number two is going, we're back in this world. Issue number three, they stop everything to do a big salute to Tolkien. Feels like that's something that they should have held off on for, you know, a couple more issues. It feels like that one needed to wait a little while, but still, it's a really good idea in there. And remember, all the characters in here, they created their own stuff. And there's one character in there who she was like the grungy, like really hard girl when she was a kid. She was the kid who was really rebellious about everything. And she creates a character who the whole idea behind her is that she basically enslaves gods. You know, the kind of thing that an edgy 16 year old would write down in their notebook. Like, yeah, and I've got gods on chains. Yeah, that stuff. So in this world, she can summon out gods to do her bidding, but she owes them something afterwards. Like, there is a give and a take with all this. There are rules to this game. So she can get them to do whatever she wants, but she then owes them something, and there comes a moment in here where this one character says, okay, you wanna do something for me to pay me back for what I've done for you? Okay, this is what you do, and because these were characters that she created when she was a kid, the god needs to bring back a very personal demon from her past when she was 16. Like, it is something that you can tell she buried deep down, but this god's like, no, 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 you need to pay me back, and I am something you created when you were 16. Here's the stuff you tried to hide when you were 16, and man, it is such a personal descent into hell for her uh, without even being too much of anything. It's not like she has to go and slay something massive. She just has to confront a thing. And it's such a deep thing to have happen with her character. So yes, that is our indie spotlight for the day. Die by Kieran Gillian and Stephanie Hans. Also, I have to give credit to Stephanie Hans because there are some gorgeous, gorgeous images in here from Stephanie Hans. She absolutely captures the feeling that this book should have. Perfectly mixing that fantasy world and just this dark, horrifying world all together. Uh, it's so weird for me to have a story like this that is very much like a Lord of the Rings, Dungeons and Dragons, just super fantasy world, 
but it feels so frightening. It's one of the best horror books that I have read all year long, and yet if you just look at it on paper, which is the way that many people look at comic books, it doesn't seem like it's going to be a horror series, but man, it is so perfect for that. So yeah, again, I just have to come in here and give it up for the team that is working on this book. Again, I've always liked Karen Gillian stuff, never loved Karen Gillian stuff. I love this book, and unless some big surprise Dark Horse just comes out of nowhere, or this book just takes a completely weird turn towards the end of it all, this is probably going to end up as my book of the year. Uh, so that is it, is getting the highest of my recommendations. Let me know what you think of this book in the comments down below, or if there's another indie book out there that you want spotlighted, let me know that in the comments down below as well. And you can always follow me on Twitter, at ProfessorThorE, to keep updated with this channel. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Come back next time. Bye.